professionals. Lakeview Health is a nationally recognized addiction and recovery center in Jacksonville, Florida that provides world-class treatment for substance and alcohol abuse. Our specialties include dual diagnosis and gender responsive treatment, trauma for women, and chronic pain recovery track. Our professionals program includes such clientele as the major airline industry and the NFL Players Trust. We've, today's topic is the ABCs of COVID-19 testing, and we've broken this presentation into three parts. The first will be about testing, and there'll be a lot of detail on testing. Some of it may be a little technical, so bear with us if you aren't a medical professional, but it will be advantageous to everyone to be able to understand when the time comes and discuss with healthcare providers or employees. It is important to know what tests are being offered in various settings. And then we will also have our medical piece. The second piece will be a brief background on the procedures and protocols we put into place here at Lakeview Health to stay open and continue to treat patients for substance abuse throughout the pandemic. This includes revised protocols, new procedures, and screenings. Some of these will take place even as stay-at-home orders are lifted and many of these can be utilized in your own workplaces, whether you are a medical facility or not. The third piece will address workplace recommendations for procedures that you can put into place and ways to reduce anxiety for employees returning to work based on what we know has worked. The last section will be question and answers, and we'll start with questions we have already received in advance and questions attendees have put into the Q&A box you should see during the discussion. Please feel free to enter into the Q&A box uh, throughout the presentation. Now I'd like to present to you uh, our two presenters, Phil Dubois. Phil Dubois is the founder and CEO of Workplace Screening Intelligence. He has provided 25 years of excellence in service and support to thousands of employers, hospitals, clinics, and other stakeholders in the industry. Previously, Mr. Dubois was executive vice president and an owner of DSI Medical Services, where he served customers such as FedEx Ground, FedEx Freight, XBL Logistics, and many other private and public employers. He was also executive vice president and an owner of DrugScan, a SAMHSA certified and CAP accredited laboratory, where he served customers such as the City of Philadelphia, third party administrators, and many hospitals and clinics. He joined DSI Medical Services and Drug Scan in November of 2008. Prior to his employment with DSI and Drug Scan, Mr. Dubois held various management positions at Quest Diagnostics, including regional sales manager and director of channel partnerships. He is also vice president of American Medical Laboratories from 1998 to 2002. And prior to this, he was a sales representative for both Allied Clinical Laboratory and Doctors and Physicians Laboratory. Mr. Dubois is a graduate of the University of Central Florida and has worked in the drug and alcohol industry, testing industry since 1992. He is an expert in the field of drug testing, the various means of testing, federal and state testing laws, company policy development, risk remediation, as well as all aspects of alcohol testing. He is a former chairman and executive board member of the Drug and Alcohol Testing Industry Association. As chairman of the Drug and Alcohol Testing Industry Association, a 1,600-member Washington, D.C.-based group, he championed the effort for the employer's rights to a safe and drug-free workplace, as well as the rights for families to have safe and drug-free homes. Our second presenter, Dr. Lanty Jernby, has been the chief medical officer at Lakeview Health. She graduated with honors from Vanderbilt University, attended medical school, and completed her residency at the University of Florida, and after completing her fellowship at Yale, was the medical director of the dual diagnosis, diagnosis unit at McLean, a Harvard University-affiliated medical hospital and one of the top-ranked psychiatric units in the U.S. She is one of only 200 doctors in the country who is dual board certified in general psychiatry, addiction medicine, and addiction psychiatry. She and her team have led the restructuring over the last nine weeks to rapidly changing protocols in order to develop new guidelines for our treatment centers to remain open amongst the COVID-19 pandemic, 
while also mitigating the potential risks for our staff and patients. Bill, would you like to take on? Thank you, Danny. I appreciate that. All right, so um, let's talk about the types of testing for COVID-19, uh, specifically what antibody testing will tell us. Um, COVID-19 is a communicable disease, and um, you're going to see many possible or maybes in this presentation. And, you know, that is not because we don't know the answer exactly, but we're learning every day about covid and as you'll see, the medical experts um, will, will say um, what is going on and what is possibility and what they know. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so for the antibody testing, mostly it's IgM and the IgG, um, which are the biomarkers which help determine uh, where the patient is in the process. And as you can see, we're talking about recent infection, whether they're recovering or they have recovered. Um, and for that recent infection, it's as long as the antibodies are present. And you should know that it takes three to seven days and sometimes longer in some other people for the antibodies to show up. Um, the different antibodies that are being tested for um, are IgA, which is the immune function of the mucous membranes. Mostly uh, IgM and IgG are what's being tested for mostly in the antibody testing, and those test results will show you, like we have listed here, IgM only um, is recent infection. IgM and IgG is infectious, and they're progressing towards a healthy state. And if it's Ig, IgG only, they are entered or entering the healthy state, and again, we say may have immunity. And you know, and just as a um, an explanation, it wasn't six to eight weeks ago that Dr. Faki, probably the, uh, the, the most known expert um, around COVID, said, I don't even know if antibody testing works, but he would bet the bank on it because it's the same way um, with a lot of other stuff. So let's point out um, an FDA disclosure to make sure that everybody understands about antibody testing, but FDA's guidance recommends that testing from antibody testing should not be used as a sole basis to diagnose or to exclude coronavirus, okay? So it's, a, it's important for you to understand that it is a tool. However, the physician makes the final diagnosis. And then um, as far as FDA approved um, versus allowed, um, pathway C, those were the manufacturers that present all the information to um, FDA ahead of time. There are two that are approved, but those are saved for hospitals. And pathway D, um, they submit everything prior to manu to, to um, distributing. They do the clinical study and their validations, but they're allowed to distribute until uh, the FDA has approved or not approved their uh, kits. Okay, so the next type of testing is um, rapid point of care testing, um, and it is for serology antibody testing. And, and just so you know, point of care means it's done wherever the patient is. So um, it's an instant result. You get three to 20 minutes, okay? And, and in most of these kits, you're gonna, and, and in most of the tests, the use is medical professional use only, um, which, you know, what qualifies as a medical professional? Um, a phlebotomist, medical assistant, on up to a nurse or a physician. They should have an understanding of how POCT works um, and as well how to read the results. It's gonna be distributed through a medical provider, or laboratory, and it could be an employer, but it has to be an employer who either employs or will contract with a medical provider to provide these services. The general availability is relatively good, um, and that will be especially when the FDA approves these in the next uh, three to seven days. Okay, um, we also have rapid point of care testing for POCT for the PCR. And this is pretty much um, the Abbott and the CFID. Um, so um, it, when it detects the actual uh, virus, the DNA of the virus, it's going to show the active infection versus what the antibody testing shows. It shows immunity um, and recent infection. So when the antibodies are present, it can show the recent infection. But the PCR, uh, POCT, shows active infection. Um, it's a medical professional use only. Also, distributions through um, hospital laboratories, you have to have that accreditation, and it's reserved, um, again, for the hotspots. So, um, uh, 
the general availability is not so great. Um, you need to either be a senator or no one to get um, to get this taken care of. And um, just as recent as this morning, there was a study that was uh, published by the New York University Hos Hospital System, and um, half of the test that um, Abbott missed, Sleaford picked up. So uh, it's probably going to uh, get Abbott looking at their test as well as um, get uh, Sleaford a little bit of uh, recognition for what they've been doing. Okay, so now um, another uh, popular type is the laboratory-based serology antibody testing that works just like the uh, POCT antibody, but it's done in a laboratory. So again, it's laboratory, medical use only. It's going to be distributed through a physician's office, a hospital, or a laboratory. And then um, just as a side note, you know LabCorp and Quest are two of the largest providers of testing um, in the nation. If you're going to go to their PSCs to get COVID-19 testing, they're only going to do the IgG. Okay, if you want to get the IgM and the IgG and or the IgA, that is only done um, at a physician's office or the hospital. And then um, there is some lab-based testing, okay, that um, can be done um, in the home. So Quest, you're actually registering at home, and then you're going to get an appointment to go to one of their patient service centers so that you can do that without going to your physician to get this taken care of. And then LabCorp, um, they have an at-home uh, test called Pixel. It's not serology, but it is a test that allows you to get done at home, and that is the PCR as well. Okay, so um, another type um, is the laboratory-based test in, with PCR, and again, it detects the virus, and it um, actually de detects infection, if you have it or not currently. Um, again, medical professional use only, and this um, you can get this in the physician's office, the hospital, or laboratory. And again, we talked about um, LabCorp has their home collection uh, that you can collect at home and send to the lab and get the results back. Um, general availability, um, at this time, it's still tough to get these um, tests. Um, it's getting better, though, and um, laboratories are starting to bring it on, so you're going to see it um, become much more available. Um, in the beginning, when there was just a few labs doing this, physicians complained that only 10% of their patients could get um, treated adequately, adequately with the amount of tests that they needed. So here, here's a quick um, testing comparison grid, and we'll just talk about each of these kits. Um, POCT serology, the availability um, is very good, so you can get them uh, quickly, um, 10 to 15 minutes, um, as, as quick as three minutes, as long as 15 minutes. And then um, they're really good um, for determining the healthy state and um, can detect recent infection um, if the antibodies are present. And then some of their weaknesses and challenges is, you, again, as the FDA said, you can't make a clinical decision on the result alone. It requires a, patient, a physician's visit to um, get that diagnosis. The future availability is very good, and especially um, once the FDA approves these under the emergency use authorization. Lab-based serology, um, there's a decent amount of availability. New people are bringing them on um, daily, so uh, you'll see the labs are um, starting to get quite a bit of this testing out there. You get the results back in one to two days, um, and again, it will tell you if you're healthy state um, or if you had um, recent infection, if the antibodies are present. Uh, same as the uh, POCT, you have to get the uh, the physician has to uh, make the final determination. And future availability is very good as well. And then for POCT, PCR, that's the Abbott test we just talked about, as well as the CFID. Um, the Abbott is five minutes, the CFID is 45 minutes, but it can give early detection. So these tests came out, it, it gave a, um, a much better chance at um, getting the PCR test. And the availability, it is challenging. Um, you, it, it's really reserved for the, um, the, hot, the hot spots. And um, if you're not in one of those hot spots, you're going to have a hard time getting it. And then for the lab-based PCR, early detection of the virus is its greatest strength. Um, turnaround time is a problem. Uh, I think LabCorp and Quest are somewhere between five and nine days. And then again, like we talked about earlier, physicians aren't ordering as much as they want because of the inventory um, isn't there. However, the uh, the future availability um, is um, improving as many labs are bringing PCR testing um, in.
Okay, so how will the testing evolve? The availability will continue to prove. Uh, we talked about uh, in each of those uh, instances they have. The FDA is doing everything they can to get more testing on the street while maintaining quality. Um, turnaround time will continue to improve as the, the lab throughput happens. Um, it, uh, it's just a matter of uh, time and a matter of equipment to get it done. Um, can you buy online? Um, well, let's talk about no to POCT serology. It's not for home use. If you heard me say um, several times, it's only for medical professionals. So you have to have a medical professional collect it. Um, you can get the um, serology lab based. You can't do it in home, but you can do it without going to your physician and you get the test done at the place. And then also the modified PCR collection is what uh, LabCorp is doing at home. And then in the very near future, there'll be a um, bit in a cup, that's a nice way of putting it, um, test coming uh, from uh, Horashore. And then let's talk about pricing, um, the affordability of it. Um, POC to serology is 15 to 25 based on volume. Um, Lab-based serology is 50 to 150, depending on um, how many you're getting? Uh, if you're getting all three of them, you're going to pay 150, and then 119 um, for the at-home test. And then for the POCT uh, PCR, the reagents and supplies are relatively inexpensive. The problem is, is the equipment to run it is a $6,000 reader for Abbott and 100,000 uh, for their architect testing. And then um, for the lab-based PCR testing, um, depending if you're just getting a COVID, more towards $100. But if you're getting um, a full panel of COVID and other uh, fungus and bacterial viral uh, tests, um, it can be as much as $500. And then um, lastly, let's talk about testing considerations. Um, we talked about, again, the FDA is in the, in the process of, of approving or denying all of the uh, emergency use kits, and it'll be in the next seven to 10 days. Uh, things to consider um, as the testing opens up. Um, this is a new market. And there's a lot of new players. So um, if you're wondering how to vet your providers and manufacturers, uh, the best tool I can tell you is use LinkedIn and um, and see what they've been doing uh, in the past. You know, if the person was selling cell phones last week, probably not the company or the individual you want to deal with. Uh, do they understand the rules? Do they understand how antibody works and antibody uh, testing? And you know, um, and just so you understand. Kits are being oversold for their value. That's part of the problem that the FDA has and why they're going through this approval process under the emergency use authorization and not enough training for the collectors. And I'll give you a couple examples so you understand. Um, so like, the, uh, will the kit find recent infection? The answer is yes, but it's yes um, if you explain that the antibodies have to be present. So it's really, it's not gonna find infection in the first two days uh, like the PCR test can but it can in three to seven days, um, depending on how that person metabolizes antibodies through their system. And then um, also it's important for you to know that the specimen well must be completely covered for the test to work. And, and every complaint that I've had, I've had about 10 complaints, um, eight of them I personally recollected and um, uh, every one of these people were negative when the first person collected it and while I collected it, I just made sure I had enough blood and, and every one of these people were terrible bleeders. They just didn't bleed well enough. So we had to work it for about three minutes and um, and we were able to get positives on every one of them. And then two um, had cassette issues. And so when I say cassette issues, um, they were from North Carolina and I asked them to take a picture. And, and in both cases, the first case, they did not cover the well completely. And in the second case, blood was all over the cassette. So I just did enough to get inside the cassette to do the test. So uh, they were retested and came back positive as well. So um, that's it for me. And I look forward to your questions and uh, talking to you in a few minutes. Oh, well, you know what? I apologize. We also had um, a couple of testing success stories. So um, a Central Florida um, town, um, the mill, the mayor had a gold seal of approval, and it really it um, it, it worked around uh, getting the businesses to volunteer to do on the following: um, providing masks for their employees, asking that their uh, customers wear masks, have a hand washing routine where they actually um, make sure that the employees wash their hands for 20 seconds every hour. Um, also taking the temp temperature of employees and customers upon entry. Um, also doing the tracing the cell phone. This was the one that caused the most consternation uh, because they were afraid um, that people 
didn't want to give their cell phone, uh, but it really um, wasn't as much of an issue um, as they thought. And then a, vol a voluntary screening program where the city actually provided the screening for the customers um, as well as the employers. Um, and then also um, this same city tested all of their first responders and they found eight symptomatic uh, individuals during the screening. And, you know, so they were able to, uh, to isolate those eight individuals. And as the fire chief said, um, this definitely saved uh, one or two firehouses from closing down and brought health um, in the police department as well. So now, uh, Dr. Jeremy, I am done and passing it over to you. Thank you so much, Phil. I have to say that um, using testing for us has really been a game changer and has made uh, made our work so much easier. But it uh, it's something that I'd love to kind of explain how we've in integrated testing both with our admissions as far as taking patients and for our staff, keeping the staff and employees safe. And I will, um, as I go through all of this with you all, uh, some of this might be applicable to your business and it may not because Lakeview is a hospital type system. We have three facilities and we admit patients to all three facilities. And it really is something where we have the capacity to do a lot of the medical procedures and protocols that I'll talk about that you may not, but we have been successful. And I really feel like uh, what we put together is, is a good protocol. Uh, that doesn't mean that it hasn't been messy. Uh, when we first started with our response to the pandemic, it, you know, we took some time to review what the CDC had out there. We took some time to review what we were seeing in our own patient population, but it, it, uh, it was every day was a learning experience. And I referred back to what Phil said earlier is that there's still a lot that we don't understand about this virus. You will see every other week, the CDC updates their guidelines. They may update symptoms. And so staying flexible and pivoting as you can with your team is gonna be really important. So one thing I, I would definitely say is that we started early here at Lakeview. Uh, and when I say early, I'm, I'm saying probably about two weeks before the state mandated a stay at home order. We were sitting down, we developed a, a COVID response team so that team uh, included our medical team led by myself and our infection control uh, official. We had our VP of operations. We included our IT chief. We also had our HR department and our compliance attorney. And we included marketing and communications. And this is, it just has turned out to be a great team because these people are, they all are so knowledgeable in all of their different fields. And we were able to combine all that knowledge in a really good way to create a good response for our patients and our staff. So that early start is really important. And maybe some of you are saying, wow, we're already nine weeks into this, but I don't think you can start any earlier than, I think it's, it's always a good time to start planning because I do feel, you know, listening to what Dr. Fauci has said, there probably will be a rebound with this virus. Um, even in the fall, when we have the flu season enter, we're gonna see some of this come back around on us. Right now, I think we're in a little bit of a, a plateau period, at least here in Florida, and we're opening up, but I think that there will be some sort of rebound with infection and having uh, a plan in place now is so important. And I'll tell you what we did do was with that team, we, we looked at uh, three main goals. The first one was to maintain a safe staff and treat our staff in a servant leadership way, meaning we supported them. If they needed help with childcare, if they needed, you know, if we had to resolve leave issues, things like that, um, that was one of our goals. And then the third goal was to maintain uh, the facility, keep it open, keep treating patients. And we've been able to keep all those goals um, successful and in fact, we've seen kind of a skyrocket of admissions because I believe of the pandemic, we have massive unemployment and, and people isolating and it really weighs on everybody's mental health. It can trigger relapse and addiction. So this has been very important to be a resource locally and nationally for people seeking treatment for addiction and mental health. And with our early screening procedures and, and, and Phil's talked about the testing, 
the very first thing we did was we set up screening for both our patients and for our staff. We knew that patients we had fair control over. We knew where they went, we could control who they saw, where they, you know, where they spent their time. But with our staff, knowing that they were able to leave at the end of the day, go home, maybe stop at the grocery store, see a family member, and then possibly get infected and spread it back at, at work the next day. So it was really important to hit not just screening for the patients that came in, but for our staff. And that screening initially was the CDC questions. And if you go on the website now, the questions have certainly gotten a lot longer, but the initial ones were cough, fever, and shortness of breath. And then, and then pretty quickly after that, a loss of smell. So those were the questions we put together. We included questions on travel, hot spot areas, exposure. And we did that for our staff. We also did fever checks every day on our staff as well. And if anybody failed those questions or had a fever of over 100.0, we sent them home before, before they went home, they were tested. And, you know, Phil had mentioned the lab PCR. Luckily, and we were just very fortunate at Lakeview, we had long-term relationships with laboratories. We were able to do that that lab PCR test on anybody who was symptomatic. Now, the challenge was it was a four to five day turnaround and people were either staying home or we had to quarantine patients. And so that is that was a real struggle. Now, we also started testing all of our, all of our admissions about three weeks in to this pandemic, knowing that there were asymptomatic people walking around, knowing people could be carrying this virus not be aware, not have symptoms, and then be a, a, a focal point to spread the infection in our facility. So we were able to pivot again, be very flexible, and we started using these point of care tests along with the swab to ensure that not only were we catching maybe somebody who had developed immunity, but we also could confirm that they did not have the actual virus or the actual viral DNA. Now, there were people we could not admit, and unfortunately, there were patients that came to us for treatment that were positive for coronavirus, and that was very difficult, and it, and it broke my heart to turn these people away, but what we ended up doing, and I think this is really um, something that's been great to see across the country, is that we were able to follow those patients with telemedicine. So they were quarantining at home, but we could see them daily. Our, our clinicians, our doctors could see them daily, talk to them, check in on them. And once they went through that quarantine period, we actually brought them back in for treatment. They had to test again and they were negative, but they were actually able to come back and, and get the treatment they needed. And so that was really rewarding that telemedicine could play a role there. So, so those are kind of the key things that we've seen with our facility. Now, we, we also employed a lot of higher level sanitation um, and, and staff and patients were very, um, very grateful for that, our approach to sanitation around the facility. We limited uh, visitors, so unfortunately families weren't allowed to come in, but we did a lot of virtual family workshops, which actually turned out to be fantastic. Everybody loved those. Uh, we were able to have family interventions. And so there was still a lot of that telemedicine and telehealth playing a role. That virtual visit was so important. Uh, and then we also really felt like the employee screenings kept our staff confident that they were coming to work. They were coming to an environment that was safe. You know, they may be able, you know, unfortunately, you might end up picking it up somewhere like at Publix or, you know, at, at, at somebody's home. But knowing that they were coming to work and knowing that everybody that showed up on site, myself, our CEO, everybody was getting tested and screened. Um, I shouldn't say tested. Everyone was getting screened and having their fever checked. And so that confidence of knowing that we have a safe environment was really important for our employees. Um, you know, Phil has talked about the point of care and he's talked about the lab PCR. And currently, those are the two tests that we do on everybody. And some people have asked, well, why do you do both tests? And I think Phil did a great job of explaining it earlier is that we do both tests because the antibody test should not be the sole way to diagnose or exclude coronavirus. You also need a, a physician evaluation 
and that viral uh, DNA PCR test, which we can get now within about 12 hours of results, which is great. Um, that is uh, that more confirmation that someone does not have the virus, they're not infected. And so we have kind of that double layer of protection and it's just that extra level of confidence. Uh, and that's why we do both tests and, they, and they've been successful. Um, I do think that the antibody testing is evolving. I know that, you know, Phil, you hit on the, um, the news recently that the FDA is evaluating all of them. Um, and that just works better for us because we'll, we'll know who the, who the real, um, the real leaders in the industry are and who are kind of the bad actors. And we can, we can certainly, um, use that information to just continue to improve our protocols. But um, it, it has just been a, it's a real fortunate thing that we have these available tests and that we've set in place all of these extra procedures. Um, thinking about kind of best practices and, and how to apply all of this to the workplace, because again, we are a hospital-based setting. We do take care of patients. We're lucky to have that medical piece in place at our facility. So we have the ability to have doctor visits and we have evaluations and, and that sort of thing. And I know there are probably businesses and corporations that might look at this and say, well, how does that really, how can I take what you're doing and apply it to my business? Because you may not have all of the, um, all of the fortunate kind of medical pieces to, to your business. So I, I just wanna hit a little bit on what we feel were really best practices. I think really number one is uh, making certain that your, your employees feel confident and safe where they are and where they're working. And some of the ways we did that I've explained earlier were setting up a work group, involving a multidisciplinary team to that work group, making sure people know that they're being screened and, and, and evaluated with temperatures, uh, making them feel they have a voice in the system. So involving people that, that uh, might not be at the top leadership level, but have experience and knowledge and having them involved with that work group is really good. Uh, I think it's also important to be really good at communicating. I, I can't tell you enough, and I, I got a little uh, bit of a hard lesson on this. You have to communicate, 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 and over-communicate. And uh, that means sharing information with your staff that may not be something you really wanted to talk about or difficult things or even things that are um, not going well or even things that might be a little scary. But the fact of the matter is that uncertainty tends to create more anxiety than um, knowing what's going on and at least knowing your leaders have a plan and they're working on things. And I can't tell you how many grateful staff have come to me after I've sent an email out and, and said, thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you for transparency. I think that communication is key. And it shouldn't just happen from leadership to staff. It should happen among your leaders. It should happen at all levels because people really need to know um, what's going on. Another key thing I'd have to talk about, and I think it's so it's been revolutionary for us at Lakeview is the this remote workforce. Uh, very early on, and again, I, I want to say it was probably March 13th, which is which was a Friday. Um, surprisingly, uh, we decided that we wanted all of our non-essential, um, well, I shouldn't call it non-essential, they were all, they're all essential employees, but all the non-patient care employees to work remote. So that would mean all of our marketing and communications, our finance, our intake, anyone that didn't have direct patient care, we sent them home. Now our IT chief probably went for two or three weeks without sleeping because he had to set everybody up remote, but he did an amazing job. And having that remote workforce was really helpful for us too, because we knew people were safe. Those, those employees were grateful knowing that they didn't have to come in and risk infection. And also knowing that they weren't necessarily gonna bring infection into the facility. Because keep in mind, your employees are going all over the place, you know, maybe, maybe not always abiding that stay at home order, seeing family, going to the grocery store, et cetera, picking possible infection up and bringing it back home, back to the workplace. So that remote workforce was so important. And what I would probably say too, is that you wanna measure that remote workforce, their productivity um, in a different way. I think it's, it's very old school to say, you know, we measure productivity as butts and seats. And I don't think that that's a 21st century way of looking at things. You really want to measure productivity in a way that 
it looks at what people get done every day, looks at the ability to maintain their calendar, to be on meetings, to be uh, uh, active and, and engaged. And in thinking that we have to have, you know, 20 people in their office physically, I think it's just an old school mentality. And honestly, looking ahead and looking at the fall and in 2021, we're not going to have a vaccine for this COVID anytime soon. I think Dr. Fauci even said most likely late next year or mid next year, but keeping people safe and keeping them remote for as long as is as possible or as long as feasible, I think is very a, a very good policy. Um, and if there's productivity issues for those folks, you address it with a supervisor. Um, if you have concerns, you 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 address it one on one. But but it has really been revolutionary for us to have that remote workforce. And then having somebody on on your team, and uh, you know, it fell to myself and our infection controls specialist. But having someone that's monitoring your state and your federal um, guidelines, having someone looking at the CDC website, reviewing all of the um, positive cases in your state or even in your county, uh, reviewing the Johns Hopkins dashboard. That's actually a really great dashboard that you can go and and put on your browser and they track global and national infections for this virus. And just knowing where a hotspot is, we had to, as a team, we had to pivot from uh, what we thought was a New Orleans hotspot. We had to pivot quickly to realize New York City was a huge hotspot and still remains one. And then here in Florida, South Florida actually has been um, a very big hotspot for us. And myself and, and our medical team have tracked the percentage of positives in all the counties in South Florida and seeing that some of them are trending down, we're able to loosen up some of our regulations on our hotspots. So all of that has been really helpful to just stay on top of all the new data. Again, we're, I think as a medical community, we're writing the playbook on this virus as it goes along. Um, and then I can't say enough. I think that testing has really changed um, for us, you know, even from the very early days to what we do now, not just with the tests we're using, but also with the results. So the timeliness of the results has really improved. You know, if we thought initially we had a four to five day turnaround on a test result and people are desperate to get treatment from us, that, that was really hard to ask them to quarantine for four to five days. These are people that might be detoxing or people that might have mental health or anxiety issues. Having them sit in a small room and not see anybody, I mean, that's excruciating. So now we have this, this about 12 to 24 hour turnaround and that has really been wonderful. And I think Phil, you, you brought up too that things are just going to improve with the technology there. And we're even looking now, I know at um, home testing at some point with that saliva test. So there's really a lot happening there. And I'll have to share with you, too, that going forward, looking at the end of the year, you know, we're in May now and I, you know, we're coming into the summer months. But I do not foresee us stopping any of our screenings for staff or patients right now. And in fact, I think we go through to the end of the year and probably into the next with the same protocols in place as far as temperatures and symptom checks and testing of all of our, our all of our um, admissions. I have kind of um, considered the idea of testing all of our employees every week. And, you know, I'm certain there are privacy rights that we have to consider with that too, but it is, there's some level of confidence that I would have of knowing everybody at, at work is, is healthy and safe. And we're not quite there yet. I, I definitely want to be strategic about how we use our tests. There's still a limited availability um, with them and I want us to use them to the, the most effective way. And I think right now we have a really good um, protocol for our staff with the screening and the temperature checks. So just a little bit of a summary, and I know I've hit on some of these points, but the, you know, one of the number one things I would say is you want to trust your staff. Um, knowing that you have their back, they will reward you with loyalty and that confidence that you are keeping this employment, uh, employment center safe, that the work site is safe. That's just going to go miles for you. Um, your staff will love you for it. They will feel good about coming to work. Um, and that goes for your remote work, too. I think the remote workers, as long as they can be productive, safe and happy, you've got um, you've got a great, a great thing going there. And I will tell you, we've been able to do that effectively at Lakeview. I also think you got to be very flexible. <laughs> 
Uh, again, like I said, it was a little messy in the beginning for us and we had to change our policy sometimes every other day and that was tough and we learned some of the hard lessons um, with, with different things that happened and so we were just very fortunate that we are where we are now, but just be flexible and adaptable. Uh, I think telehealth, we are, we are in a 21st century revolution with that. A lot of the, the laws have been relaxed as far as telehealth. We are able to communicate with patients across the country. Doctors like myself, I'm seeing patients in Texas and in um, North Carolina. I mean, it has really made uh, our business so much more um, national and has really helped us get people into treatment that we never thought we'd be able to do. So that's so important. And that virtual capability, which is it carry, it kind of piggybacks on the telehealth piece, um, being able to have family workshops virtually, have um, interventions with patients virtually, have a follow-up with a patient for six to 12 months after they come for treatment on site. All of that is so amazing. Uh, and then again, I've kind of hit on some of the anxiety that employees might have about coming to work now. And then what do you do when you want to start bringing them in um, at, on site? You know, when we're maybe in a safer place with this virus and we want to talk about people um, coming back to work in, in the facility itself. And those are things that we're still working on and still figuring out. Um, I think one of the approaches we'll be doing is staggering people, meaning bringing people on maybe a couple days a week. Um, we've brought some of our medical providers on site a couple of half days a week right now. Um, so it's really, and it's going to have to be individualized too, because you'll have patients and staff, I'm sorry, you'll have staff that may have medical issues. Um, that they they that put them at a higher risk for getting coronavirus. And so you really have to think about all of that. And that's where your HR department and your compliance department are going to be critical for you too. Um, one thing we've also looked at is future employees. How are we going to handle hiring and bringing new people on site as well? So that is something where we're using the testing again and we're using the screening process and looking at how we keep everybody safe and, and integrate a new workforce. And then, of course, knowing your, your center guidelines and, and what um, hours and information are available, making sure that you have um, uh, certain people that are allowed on site. We, we did limit a lot of family visitations and visitors themselves and tours, and we're probably going to be opening that up a little bit more, but we still need to maintain that safety. So those are, those are the new normal workforce um, or workplace ideas that we've put together here at Lakeview. And Danny, I'm sure you probably have questions that have popped up for us. Hi, yes. Great job. Let's look at some of the um, questions that we had in advance. Um, one was, and I think this one uh, goes to you, Phil. Um, should we consider creating a partnership with a local testing facility to send employees to? or a testing center when we suspect they may be sick, or is the recommendation maybe to go to their own doctor? And I guess this could be for Lancey or Phil. Sure, well, I'll start um, if that's okay. And I'll just say um, uh, the most important thing is you, got, you have to have a relationship with a physician that you can send the uh, individuals to when they test positive. That's the most important part. And then um, if you don't have that medical professional um, at your location, whether you hire them, um, employ them, or whether you contract with them to come in and do those collections, then yes, you should definitely have um, a testing center where you can send people to, whether that's a um, physician or whatever the case may be, uh, but you need to definitely have um, that taken care of ahead of time. And, and I would just piggyback on that saying, absolutely. We we have a different kind of setup at Lakeview because we have positions and we have a lab on site. But one of the early things that we looked at doing was actually partnering with Mayo because uh, they're local here in Jacksonville. And they, um, they had some of the faster testing um, kind of protocols in place. So we actually did form a partnership with them. Um, but right now we're actually using our original lab because the, the results came back much faster for us. And so it just seemed to make a lot more sense that way. But partnerships have been so critical for us. Great. Um, the other question we have here is, uh, how have your patients responded to being tested at admission? 
So I would say they all love it <laughs> because they know that they're coming in and they know everyone else is being tested. And so they'll be safe. Um, multiple patients have told us this. And in some of the, in some cases, um, they, they get a little bit riled up because maybe they think someone hasn't been tested and they, they get a little anxious over it. But it, it has actually worked out in our favor. It, just people feel so confident that they, they know they're coming to a safe facility. So they love it. Great. Um, will this presentation be available afterwards? Yes. Uh, here in Georgia, testing has been an omission. The guidelines were, and some still are, so strict and narrow that it takes three to four days to convince uh, the health department. I don't know if you guys have any comments there. I can, I can, I don't know, Phil, you've had some experience. No, no, go we, ahead. Yeah, I mean, that was initially what we would see with some of our staff, actually. They they would tell us, you know, their calls from home. I have a fever, I have a cough. I went to the local hospital, I went to the Department of Health, and they wouldn't test me. They said that I probably had it. And honestly, my thoughts on that, and Phil, I'd love to hear what you think, but I think it was because the testing availability was so limited that we were reserving it for, like you were saying earlier, the, the real critical ICUs in the, in the hospitals, rather than doing the general population. So when we heard that from a staff member, we just tested them because we, thank goodness, I mean, we were so fortunate, but we could test and get the results back. And we could say, okay, no, you don't, you probably have the flu. And actually we can do the flu testing as well. So it was, it was, it still happens too. I think we had a few staff last week that had the same experience. Um, I think it is, as testing becomes more available, this will change. And uh, Dr. Jeremy, I uh, completely agree with you. Um, uh, the, the testing is coming available. And at one time I heard a physician on TV um, said that uh, it was, uh, she could only test 10% of the people that she thought she absolutely should test. And she said it killed her to, to not be able to test the other 90%. So it's, it's, that was four to six weeks ago. So um, it's definitely improved and the availability is getting better every day. That's great. Perfect. Um, one of the other interesting questions we have here is, um, what would be a reasonable accommodation for an employee who can't wear a face mask? Um, is a face shield a good alternative? Well, I did read um, a recent article about face shields versus face masks, and I believe the face shield actually has better protection depending on the type of um, material it's made of. The, the face masks, I know the CDC initially said only people that had a uh, cough or, or symptoms should wear them. Now we have everybody wearing them. So clearly we've evolved to a different state, but I, I would say the face shield is probably safer. Um, if you had to choose. And, um, you know, I honestly think it's going to be really the availability of PP that limits people. We've seen it in our facility. Um, we've seen it nationally. We have encouraged our staff to wear cloth masks if they have them and launder them the way the CDC guidelines are. Um, but we also have uh, paper masks available. But it's always, it's always a little bit like whack-a-mole. You're always trying to keep up with with um, all the PPE and there's been all this kind of fraud around it too that I've read about. So it's been a big challenge. But right now, um, you know, with that knowing if someone can't wear a mask, I think the face shield is a good alternative. Terrific. One of the other uh, questions that we had come in, and this one is for Phil, um, are there, how do you think the additional costs will affect businesses for testing? Do you think that new demands for COVID-19 testing will potentially reduce uh, random testing for substance abuse or other preventative tests in healthcare? That's a good question. So, um, you know, let's just take a look at like Lakeview. Um, it, yes, it's an additional cost to testing, but it's an absolute necessary investment. If they don't do the testing, they're either gonna lose the facility to COVID-19 because someone's gonna come in that's uh, asymptomatic and it's gonna spread it to everybody else, um, uh, or they just close down and go home and wait for uh, everything to get better, which is you know no way to, to run a business. So I think it's just a necessary investment that you have to do in order to, uh, to be able to serve the public. 
And as far as the um, uh, the random testing and, and everything else, so for the DOT, there is no excuse um, for, so that's the DOT truck drivers, pilots, there is no valid excuse for um, a anyone not to do the DOT random testing. But I can tell you from the non-DOT, so the people that are just doing random testing because that's their choice, um, that has been cut down dramatically. They don't want anybody on their workplace that isn't absolutely necessary. So the random collectors that come on um, aren't coming on. And um, in most cases, they'll send them to a LabCorp request to get it done. But that has cut by at least 25 to 50%. So um, that has been affected, but for DOT, no effect. Okay. Um, one of the other questions again for Phil, uh, for lab-based PCR, what amount of time is considered early detection? So it, it can happen in the first uh, one to three days. It's actually looking for the um, RNA of the virus, just like our DNA, but it's looking for the RNA and they do a, a process called PCR amplification and it will multiply the little bit of um, viral load that they have thousands and thousands of times until they can find it. So that's how they can find it in a couple of days. It's really um, remarkable science that has changed over time. Okay, this one for Lancy. Um, should we invest in employee face masks and require them? What are your thoughts on that? Well, we did not initially do that at Lakeview because we were following the CDC guidelines, but we ended up investing and we supply them for all our employees. Now, right now we recommend them uh, and that's based also on CDC. We do not require them, but I will tell you, I'd say 90% of our, our employees are wearing face masks. So I would invest in it and I would also invest in, if you're looking at your, your business or your company, I would invest in a good couple of thermometers, check temps every day, um, screen. I think that's critical. Again, the, the fever thing, the CDC came out with that as one of the number one or the most common, I should say, the most common symptoms of COVID, early sign. Um, loss of smell now is becoming a very common early sign. So all of those things go into that screening regimen. I think if you can prevent COVID from coming into your workplace through those methods, I think that's so critical. Now, the face mask thing also is important, but th but that screening really has been invaluable for us. Okay, also, do you think, um, is it feasible to automatically check employees for fevers and quarantine to protect our workforce? Is that something that you feel people can, you, you know, manage? I mean, if you have, you know, 200 employees, is it feasible to test everyone for a fever every day? It can be done. Uh, there's actually another corporation that I kind of did a little like um, consulting with about the, the fever check thing. And they were a non-medical company. And so they were they had a factory and they had about I want to say about 200 employees that they were on site every day. And they set up a system where they check them. Now, it, it adds maybe 20, 30 minutes to the work day. So they, they actually were forward thinking and said, okay, well, we're going to have to pay them for overtime for that extra 20, 30 minutes they're in line. But they had the glass barrier or the, the plastic barrier you're probably going to see now in all your grocery stores and everything. And they had the, the thermometer that you hold to the forehead and it, it's been working well from what I understand. So it's feasible. And I honestly think it's one of, uh, it's a key thing to be doing along with, again, checking with your employees about exposure, travel and symptoms. So how does that work as far as screening? Is that something that you verbally do or, you know, is it two or three questions or is it something that they fill out? Like, what are some of the uh, ways that we're, we're, we're screening? So we have, I want to say there are about seven questions. And yeah, that's another, you know, additional 20 minutes or 30 minutes to your workday. But what we do is we um, we have these seven questions. They they are presented with those questions. If they answer yes to any of them, then we select them out. We test them. You know, we check their temperature, and then we make a decision. So that the the response team makes a decision based on how their patient or how the staff is presenting and all of that. Um, one thing that our infection control specialist Casey Sasser has come up with, which I think is brilliant, is having it on an iPad, um, having the questions kind of digitized. 
and it's a little bit faster and, and it, you know, you're limiting kind of exposure and things like that where people aren't touching a million pens and all of that. And so they just come in, they answer all the questions. It's real quick. They get their fever checked or their temp checked and they go, they go onto the workstation. So there's some new, new technology coming out looking at fever checks as well. Um, I have to read a little bit about that. That's something new that I just saw um, on the, on the news recently. Um, one of the other questions is, uh, do you suggest screening or examining high-risk staff members, uh, 50 and older, raising hand, um, differently from those who are not in that group? Well, I will tell you that our, our older staff, and we looked at, I think it was 60 and over, um, we looked at those staff members we help them work remote if they could. Most of them could work remote. Um, and if they didn't work remote, we gave them special accommodations that were to limit exposure. So we did take into account that, that kind of elevated risk. And that was, that's been very important. Again, I feel it's so important to, to communicate to your staff that you, your, their safety, their health is so important. Um, it's a top priority. So that everybody's responded well to that. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, we did have a couple of recommendations from uh, HR that I also wanted to share. Um, one is to, you know, companies often provide EAP info as part of a handbook or, you know, a sign in the break room. And if there was probably ever a time for employees to understand what their EAP is, who it is, how they work, uh, the phone number, uh, that's, this is really a, an important time when employees come back to work for them to understand that and know how to use that. Um, it may even be suggested to ask your rep to host a virtual meeting for your employees to talk them through um, some of the challenges that they may have. Uh, know your local testing center guidelines and provide this info to employees so that you're not having to go look for locations and hours pre-qualifications for employees to get tested uh, for the various sites that are in your area. Um, and then check out your benefit info. Uh, will employees be charged for an office visit if they go for a test or does the provider offer it for free? Uh, will the test fee be waived in certain situations if there's a true concern over an employee? Um, you know, one of the other things is to certainly make sure that your COVID-19, uh, that you have a workforce in place. And some of the suggestions for um, that workforce is to, you know, have a group of people that are trusted in your organization and have them uh, be able to, you know, meet as a group and help make the employees feel like they're a source or a resource for them to go to. Um, it's not always going to be feasible, especially if you have a small HR department for employees to always be able to go to HR. So if you have a work group, um, the, that work group can help with the temperature checks. Maybe you can, you know, have a rotating group of employees who are willing to do temperature checks. Not everybody has to be a nurse to use a, a, a fever thermometer that goes up to the forehead. Um, investigate the cost of cleaning crews and increase the frequency of the sanitation that you're doing in your facility. Um, very often people have, you know, a, cl a cleaning crew that comes in once a week. Um, look at the cost of increasing that. It could be worth it uh, when you consider the cost of losing employees who are sick because everything wasn't disinfected. Um, the other thing is to create a private and, and confidential process for employees who may have concerns about coworkers. Um, you know, not everybody can always see a coworker that's coughing or sneezing, um, you know, but people should be able to have a way to communicate that to management without, you know, that whole, you know, well, so-and-so said. Um, so create a confidential way and a reporting process to do that. Um, as Lancy said earlier, dedicate someone in the group to continually monitor the CDC, John Hopkins, and websites. And use your communications and your marketing people to help you communicate that to employees um, so that they can make it as part of the regular employee communications that they do. Um, 
and, you know, make, you know, have some fun ways upon returning to work, you know, maybe have a create your own mask day, the first day everybody comes back to work and have a contest, um, make it a little bit fun. And then the last thing that um, Lanty, that we wanted her to discuss a little bit was, you know, what are some of those things that you can look for in employees ret upon returning to work that may show that they're having more anxiety that they let on or different behaviors that they're showing um, upon return to work that would indicate that perhaps there were some issues that went on during the, while they were working remotely or upon return that should be addressed. So thinking about when people do return to work and having anxiety, you mean Danny about like being on site? You know, I think one of the things I've seen is that people, um, people their personalities might change a little they might seem a little less less confident or they may seem apprehensive they might even be calling in sick um just because they're very anxious about returning they may share it with you know friends that they have anxiety um i i think it's very important to be able to identify employees that have anxiety over that people won't um, uniformly feel good about coming back i know they won't um there are some people that feel differently about the virus than others, and it really depends on their experience, their age, their medical conditions. So just being mindful of that. And, and if people can work remote, I really feel that that they should be able to do that for the, the, you know, the near and far future right now, um, just because we, there's so much that's still unknown. I think we've maybe started just week two of opening up here in Florida and, and we still don't know what will happen as far as a rebound. So I think that having that remote work option is, is very important. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending today and uh, we appreciate you joining us and uh, please visit lakeviewhealth.com and uh, appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Thank you.